jump into. So uh, I'm going to try to uh, stay on the same kind of uh, uh, perspective and tone that uh, Heinz started. Uh, and I'd like to give my perspective on uh, uh, what I have learned about uh, immigration policy and their impact and uh, um, what we know and what we don't know about the effect of immigration uh, policies. So I am an economist and my main focus actually has been in researching the impact of immigration in the receiving country. But every once in a while I do some exploration on what determines immigration and that's where I... Uh... So the question that uh, I started from uh, here is uh, uh, there seems to be a consensus among economists that there are huge gains from people moving around town. And uh, uh, there is works uh, by Michael Clayton that, that, that says there are trillions of dollars there to be gained. However, if you look at migration data, few uh, people seem to move around, right? And I am sure that this number in percentage of the population has not gone up very much. Only about 3% of the world population is resident in a different country from where they are born. The perception is that large part of this lack of mobility may be due to policy barriers. And so the question is what will happen or can we learn something meaningful and interesting about what will happen if we reduce or significantly change this barrier? Of course, we would like to know what will happen to the number of people who migrate as well as to the type of people, the selection of people who migrate, and where will they go? So this is a first order, I think, of importance question uh, for economists and for migration studies. So where do we get an idea that there are potentially a lot of migrants out? I'm going to, in a second, tell you what I think are the three main ways in which economists approach this, mo this way, and then this uh, question, and then I will go a little bit into what do we do technically with each question. But uh, if you look at some surveys, uh, this is taken from Gallup World Poll, that was uh, uh, given to uh, citizens of around 150 countries in the world. If you look at the percentage of people here divided between people without and people with college education who actually migrated as a percentage of the world population uh, in 2000-2010, this is a small percentage. And even the stock of migrants, the stock of people who are uh, in 2000 in a different country is just 1.8 of the world population much larger, in fact, among the college educated. But if you look at people who answer that they would migrate given their possibility, well, this percentage is much larger. Well, to tell you the truth, it's not massively larger. So this is from the database, that, the micro database that we received and cleaned. So about 10% of non-college educated in the world say that if they were given the opportunity, where given the opportunity is not very, it's not clear uh, what it exactly means, but let's assume that this means that they could have a visa or a work permit in a country, at least uh, uh, the, this percentage of migrants could increase by one order of magnitude, maybe. Although this is not 100%, nor this is 100%. And so not everybody will migrate. Who and uh, uh, how many? That's the question. So um, the way in which I see economic research in this is that there have been three ways in which economists have tried to tackle this, uh, tackle this question. So um, the, the, the first way is we have been building models which have been quite uh, theoretical in which individuals who are rational choose where to locate and then there are some benefits of moving because you increase your wages and cost of moving uh, which are the barriers, part of which are legal barriers. Then we use this model and we try to calibrate, we say well, we match some of the differences in wages and income across countries and then we simulate in this model what happens if we remove some of these barriers. So these are models which have a heavy amount of, and dense amount of assumption. They have many parameterization. So I will not review very much this. I have done exploration using this method. Most of this method, though, will imply, and logically, that if you remove barriers, there are going to be massive flows internationally because the wage differential, as Hein was saying, just based on the wage differential, these are so big across countries that when you remove this, you will have massive flow and massive gains. The extent to which this predicted massive flow and massive gain resemble what will happen is not clear because these are quite theoretical models. Then there is a second type of approach that economists have used, and not only economists, which is, well, let's try to be a little more serious about policies. Let's try to measure, to attach some indices to migration policies. And then, given that very different countries between them have very different migration policies, let's use these migration policies and the changes in migration policies that these countries have 
and the correlated change in migration and change in selection of migrants to learn something about the effect of these policies. So this is um, a more econometric and data-based approach, and I will give a little bit of an example of what uh, this does. But this has been very popular, and I think in this I would say it's going to be crucial what kind of measure of these policies we use, how do we go about measuring them, and also it's going to be very, very hard ultimately for a hard-nosed economy to really establish that this is a causal connection because you have a lot of things happening at the same time, so identification is not too clean. But in a sense, this is a useful exercise to learn about policy and to learn about correlation between policies and flows. And I will, uh, I will explain uh, how this works with one example. And then the third way in which uh, we have been going, and this is a little more recent, I would say, is uh, can we use uh, some of these uh, polls or some of these surveys which have been done in different countries asking people, would you make me migrate if you had the possibility? Or would you migrate if you were given a chance to learn what is the actual and the potential amount of migrants in different countries? And then again, often in a simple econometric framework, we're going to try to assess how much of these uh, potential migrants will become actual migrants. And we are going to use this extra information from the polls, uh, combined with information from the actual flows of people, to learn about that. Now, I think the hard part of this approach is that there is no question and no poll which is broad enough. So the, uh, this Gallup poll that I will illustrate a little bit are the ones which have been broader in their reach in the world. But even there, the question which is asked can be framed as uh, capturing some uh, policy barriers, but maybe even other type of barriers. And so it's a little hard to disentangle. So what I want to go do uh, today is that uh, I'm going to give you a couple of examples of uh, economists that have been progressive. I have tried each one of these three approaches in my uh, career, I would say, uh, admittedly, with very poor results, in fact. Uh, in, in part, of this, uh, uh, this uh, summary is an admission of my complete ignorance, and uh, uh, on the other hand, is an admission of how much we need to understand. I will focus on approach two and three, so I will skip completely the purely sort of model-based one. And, uh, um, and uh, I think that we can learn a lot. So I think there is no other way. We need to embrace each approach, go all the way down in each one of these appro approach. But then we have also to step back, see what we have learned, and combine, and in the end, retain only what is really robust across these three approaches. So this approach number two, I'm going to just illustrate, referring uh, with a couple of slides to this uh, uh, paper that uh, I had with Francesco Ortega, which is now, now published. However, we started writing this paper in 2009, so when you guys started your approach, and in fact, we didn't have this uh, neat uh, uh, improvement and categorization of policies, so we did this uh, homemade classification of policies there. And uh, uh, the idea, though, is to provide you a little bit what is the frame. The idea is that, uh, we have used this sort of, uh, sometimes it's called a gravity type of approach, in which the log of migrant between origin and destination depends on a bunch of factors which are origin and time specific, a bunch of factors which are destination specific. Then you want to zoom into some particular factor which has to do with the geography of these two countries, uh, distance uh, and maybe not only uh, distance border, sharing the border, some uh, geographical feature some uh, bilateral immigration policies, and some measure of the network of the old migrants that were there. This is a very general structure. We apply it here, and I'm going to tell you a little bit how, but there are a ton of paper out which have been read, written with this structure, which you shouldn't just go take and apply to your problem. You should think if this part of this paper was microfounding a little bit this structure into a decision of the individual, uh, and so there was a simple model. The point, though, that, and the value that I want to point my attention at is in this spot that we could, in part, tell by controlling, after controlling for a bunch of factors, what was the impact of some laws, and in particular, in some changing laws, because by controlling the fixed effect, you only use the change of these laws over time, capturing immigration policies. Now, um, let me say a couple of things. It matters a whole lot to what kind of data you have. And the better data we get, the more we know. In this paper, we, for instance, measure migration, migration uh, using, this was migration between the 74 country of origin and 15 country of destination, so you already see much smaller sample than now has been extended to. But we measure them with using uh, a migration database from the OECD that only gives you gross flows. 
And again, you have to ask yourself, is this a good or a bad thing? I think, uh, uh, looking exposed, uh, this misses a lot. These gross flows, first of all, are mostly based on regular migration between countries. Uh, after that, I've mostly used the net flows, which are changing stock coming from census, uh, uh, census uh, sources. So I think these data were particularly imprecise. But we wanted to see, on the other hand, what was the effect of some immigration policy. So maybe you do want to see the impact on gross flow because this policy only affects the immigrants into those countries. Be as it may, with this, uh, uh, we used this uh, uh, database. And then, so just here, I think I have a couple of figures just to show you. Uh, using these flows, for instance, first of all, I agree with Hein. This is the very first thing. Don't believe people say globalization is happening like crazy. Uh, so migration must be going up. Not clear. In all data, this is not clear, depending where. Some countries in this period had an immigration boom, so Spain immigration increased a lot. Other had some slow trend up. Germany had a big spike uh, uh, with the uh, Eastern uh, session and then a big decline. Uh, Switzerland also had some ups and downs. So there were countries which had experienced all type of profile over time immigration. There was not a generalized increase in immigration in these countries. The biggest task, though, here is really, I think, thinking seriously about how to capture immigration laws and translate them into something that you can measure and for which you can attach an impact on. So in this, uh, uh, in this uh, uh, attempt here, we really put a lot of arrays, trying a lot what we thought. Now uh, they were just a few compared to what you guys have. Uh, uh, to gather some information about reforms. And then we constructed this uh, uh, index of tightness of entry law, which uh, I think is maybe the very uh, pain precursor of what uh, I has mentioned. But here we took some very simple rule. For instance, it's very complicated to take laws and transform them into an index. So for instance, uh, we uh, had this index going up and down in tightness. If a country would have increased the fee that you have to pay to apply, or if the country would have increased the number of documents that you have to present to apply, we gave this a plus one. If a reform increased, it, plus one. Or if a country would have restricted the quota of one type of visa from 60,000 people per year to 40,000 people, we, we gave them a uh, plus one, more tighter uh, uh, title for one year. And then we also tried to capture some, uh, some of the laws uh, uh, that uh, had to do with enforcement. So uh, we constructed this index, but we were wise enough, I think, also to say, well, this is an index, but there are some laws that seem to have a particular status. In particular, the master treaty in Europe, which should have created complete free mobility of worker, was coded in this data set as a one policy by itself. The Schengen agreement across the country, which introduced a common border control at the border, was coded as one. Um, just to give you some example of how hard it is to do this, let me just point on this Canada. In, for instance, Canada in 1993 passed a policy in which the uh, changing government corresponded for an immigration policy that removed the quotas. So before there were some numerical quotas, and then it was introduced a much more, uh, a much more specific point system in which quotas, as I said, were removed, and now applications were considered based on uh, uh, skills and education. Now, we coded this as a minus one, an opening up, a loosening, because you were losing some quantitative control and we're introducing more qualitative. But really what did this, what this policy did was not just, uh, it was not so much loosening as opening up to much more skilled migrants than uh, Canada was before, because this uh, point system was very much uh, about it. So in that paper, I'm going to show you some results on the quantity of immigrants that this uh, index uh, had. But uh, um, very important is to think not only about the simple tightness of uh, effect on total immigrants, but on the type uh, of immigrants. So in that uh, categorization, as I was telling you, this is uh, the behavior of this policy index. So for instance, Canada looked like they have uh, uh, loosened significantly their uh, immigration policy starting from 1989. But a lot of this decline is because they have become more and more open to highly skilled immigrants. Canada is quite hard to enter for people who don't have a high skill, but the share of immigrants in the nation is 33% because a lot of highly skilled. The United States 
looks like they actually were becoming more and more open until around September 11th when there was some reversal of this. So we looked at this and we thought, well, they make some sense. But of course, uh, now this is history. I think there is a much better way. I think, though, it is needed to have a very careful approach to how you code this and a very careful approach of what you are doing when you are coding uh, you know. So in this paper, we can go to the next. Uh, let me just show a couple of uh, uh, estimates here. I apologize, estimates are, are ugly here, but I, we just focus on one column uh, uh, over here. So one thing that I want to communicate here is that in this uh, approach that we had, it was pretty clear that this index of entry tightness worked quantitatively in the way you expect to work. Higher tightness will reduce migration, but it also was pretty clear to us that it had a very small quantitative effect. So this small number, 0.02, means that by increasing, by passing one reform, which would have increased by one, our tightness index, you would have decreased immigration by 2%. 2% of the total. So if you had an immigration which was 1% of the total population, it would become 1.1% of the population, 1.2% sorry, percent, uh, of the population, so very small. Even Maastricht, which is this bilateral variable that in our original opinion captured free mobility across water, had only an effect of 10. So again, uh, two countries which were identical before and after Maastricht only had, uh, controlling for all these other characteristics, only had an increase by 10% of bilateral migration. Again, if you had 3% of the population that migrated from one country to the other before Maastricht, after Maastricht you had 3.3% rather than 3.0%. So a small effect, really, of uh, this, uh, this variable. So, on one hand, I think that we were, uh, we were uh, thinking, well, it's important to do and code this policy better and do a better job, but this first back of the envelope type of analysis made us think that uh, tightness goes the way. However, the quantitative results seem to be uh, quite small, and even the quantitative result of something as extreme as free mobility, although admittedly between European countries where the mobility is low because uh, income differential were not very large, uh, only gives you a quite small impact. And this uh, uh, sort of uh, in part puzzled us, but in part made us think that we had to improve the data and uh, the type of analysis. So in this other approach, so this is an example of the, uh, for, just, just skip this. Um, so uh, in type three approach, so this was type two, in type three approach that I'm gonna document a little bit based uh, on this other re recent paper that we have in which we used this uh, information in the question, if you have an opportunity uh, would you migrate to another country? And then there is a follow-up question, where would you migrate? We wanted to try to figure out how knowing about the intention to migrate could help us improve, uh, identify the effect of policies on migration. In particular, in this model, in this paper here, we had a little bit of a two-step approach to this issue. Before, you could just look whether the flow of migrant was related to the policy, and that's what you had to do here. You can assume that the migration process at least had two steps. One in which people decided whether or not they would be willing to migrate if they had the opportunity. Go into from, from total population into people who are potential migrants. And then potential migrants were finding some migration opportunity and were taking advantage of them and from potential to actual migrants was the second step. Because we could measure what we consider potential migrants, we can estimate this with this extra step. And our thought is that policy should have been particularly important in translating uh, in, in affecting this second step. You decide if it's good to migrate for you based on cost-benefit analysis, and maybe policy entered, but the way in which the question was framed, we thought that this was merely based on how much you assess your gain to be. But then whether you can migrate or not, if you can become from a potentially natural, it matters a lot what type of migration restriction you have. Again, a massive simplification, immigration has many more than two steps, and immigration is more complicated than this, but just to be operational, uh, we did uh, it this way. So here, in writing this paper, we also di uh, uh, understood, <coughs> and we had understood before, I didn't show you that, one key distinction was in the be migration behavior of people with different levels of education. There are many other dimensions in which people have a different behavior uh, in terms of migration, but this education, in particular tertiary and non-tertiary education, 
seem to be crucial. It seems, uh, and this seems to go with a lot of other differences on the labor market in terms of wage, in terms of earnings potential uh, that people find between college and non-college. And so we decided that to do also a job that would tell something about the selection of migrants, we would have split always uh, these two types of population and look at different response. Uh, um, of uh, uh, different response of these two groups, uh, uh, both as potential migrants and actual migrants. Um, so in this database, now we had, uh, so now uh, we use many more countries uh, in, uh, of origin into 30 destination countries, which are mostly OECD. And now we have, uh, uh, we use as uh, actual migrant, we use net migration, which comes from census stock data differentiated. And this uh, is uh, uh, some work that uh, Frederick has done uh, and the World Bank, but the bilateral database has a lot uh, of the same sources as the Delhi database. And then for design migration, we use this uh, source, which is this Gallup global poll. We had access to all the polls done by Gallup in all countries in the world. And uh, uh, this covers uh, two thirds of actual migration and 85% of uh, uh, desired country of, of uh, migration where people would said that they would uh, like to go. And how did we, uh, uh, what is a desired migrant? Is a person answer yes to this question? Ideally, if you had the opportunity, you would like to move permanently to another country. Or would you prefer living in your country? And then the follow up is where would you move if you had the opportunity? We take this almost as showing us potentially, if we really lower the barriers, how many people there were that uh, would migrate. Um, yeah, definition of the variable, but it's pretty clear. I'm going to show you a little bit about actual migration and desired migration rates in uh, country of origin. And the potential, so actual people who migrate, desire are people who say they would migrate, but they have not migrated, and potential is the sum of the two. Um, let me just show a stylized fact, a couple of stylized facts here. So um, I showed you this table uh, at the beginning, but that table at the beginning was as a ratio of population in the world. Look at how this table changes when you only look at the receiving country point of view. And this is the other thing. As I said, there has not been massive increase in migration in the world, but there's been increased in migration into a selected group of countries. And this selected group of countries are also the countries where people say they would like to go. And Europe and the United States are a big chunk. So if you only look at the receiving country, the receiving country receive right now, 9% uh, of the receiving country population without college degree is foreign born among non-college, and 11% uh, is foreign born as college. If all people who say they would go in this country uh, would be actually put in those countries, then you see how, first of all, now migration is a skill bias. There will be more skill. This will flip. More unskilled people will be in the rich country than skilled. And this is not because unskilled people are more willing to migrate. They're in fact less willing to migrate if you look at the origin. But it's just that in the origin, there are so many more people without a college degree that even accounting for their bias, there will still be this uh, uh, increase. So this was a first thing. Um, um, and, uh, and we said, well, if you just look at this number, you would infer that maybe free mobility will change significantly the number of people and will also change the type and the selection of people. However, let's go and put this in this two-step uh, little procedure uh, in which we see how policy affects the number of potential migrants and how policy affects the number of potential migrants who translate into actual migrants. Let's pass on this. Um, um, oh, sorry. Uh, before doing that, uh, uh, five minutes, yes. Uh, before doing that, let me show you a couple of correlations. The, our first uh, question was: uh, Do these data on willingness to migrate really reveal anything which is important? Or people just answer like this when they are asked, "Where would you go?" And this is very different from then what they will do and where they will go. So, are these? Uh, uh, potential, so willingness to migrate and the actual migration correlated across countries. And what we found is that, yes, there seems to be some information on content because if you plot for college educated and non-college educated for one country, what is the rate of potential migration and the rate of actual migration, 
these are net rate of migration. That's why in the actual migration there can be some negative uh, uh, numbers. If you plot this, you find a very strong or a strong positive correlation, incredibly strong for college educated. Even if you throw away a lot of the higher number and if you focus only on up to one. So these are very small countries in which there is a ton of people abroad uh, uh, relative to uh, uh, and there are many college educated. But even if you take the countries which are not outliers, you observe a very strong correlation. So clearly these reveal an information which is relevant when people make their decision and they move. But uh, what about uh, this uh, simple two-step approach? What does that say, in particular now, on the role of policies, right? So again, in this two-step approach, we take twice a little bit the same uh, uh, type of uh, uh, model, in which here we have, uh, first, the potential migrant from origin to destination. And look at how this depends on the destination country income per capita employment rate, this proxy for the economics of the receiving country. And then we control for networks, and this distance is actually a sequence of geographical uh, characteristics and cultural uh, uh, characteristics. And then uh, population, and then next, what we focus on is uh, how policies uh, affect this. In this paper, we actually took a much simpler, we moved away from the index because by then we realized that our Mickey Mouse index was too simplistic. I guess we were still too ignorant about your index and, uh, and we will we'll, we'll learn some to use it. And so we did some sort of very simple measure of migration policy. One is, again, we thought that if one policy could have an impact was that of allowing people to freely move between countries. And so we took all the bilateral agreement of this country that let worker work freely. And these were, are, of course, all the EU, but the EU has this agreement also with a few other countries, Switzerland, uh, some of the, um, uh, the Scandinavians have this between themselves. So we took this very particular price free labor by, by and then the other um, index that we used, which, was, which is, again, um, uh, if, um, for ignorance of your better index, was to measure if the two countries had a visa waiver agreement. This is, uh, uh, you need a tourist visa to measure to go in the other country or not. And uh, absolutely, these are visa waiver agreements that only allow short-term uh, visits, so it shouldn't affect really the possibility of working, but they are very often correlated with particularly strong relationship and make it particular ease, particularly easy to go to the country. They may be correlated with other policy, they may be correlated to also people who come in and stay uh, and find another way of staying. And we're going to measure what's the impact of these two things on potential migration first, and then on translating potential migrant into actual migrant. Uh, so the results are summarized here. There is a table in the next, uh, uh, in the next uh, chair. But just to give you a, an idea, in this database, the average migration rate for college, the average potential, this is potential rate, for college educated uh, bilateral is 0 0.7 and for no college is 0 0.49. It means that in one decade, decade 0.7% of college educated will move to the average country of destination. And you see that there is a larger percentage of college than non-college educated that would like to move to another country. But the difference is not so large. It's one to, not even one to two. It's just 60% larger. The uh, economic variable and the network variable have the effect that you would expect. And what you find is that in determining potential migration, the presence of bilateral agreement does not seem to have any effect whatsoever. This for us was a check of reality if we were really capturing only policy barrier or not. And if you're really only really uh, capturing policy barrier, how hard it is to go in the country, that shouldn't affect your will, your idea that it would be good for you to go in the country because you gain, because you have a higher, but it should only affect the actual possibility of going in the country. So this no effect was taken by us as a good sign. And then in the step two, we want to control for the potential migrant and see how much actual migrant were affected by potential, other the growth of income, and then the policy variables themselves, which are again these two policy variables, to see if in transforming potential into actual migrant, now if policy had some impact but still control for the economic determinant. And sorry, I, I didn't don't list them, but we have the same type of determinants here. And again, here, as well, just to give you, uh, so again, this is the, 
uh, uh, let me just point at two, at two, at two uh, numbers that I want to emphasize. This is for the non-college educated, the next is for college educated. The first thing that we were struck is that while potential integration affects a lot, very significantly actual integration, the coefficient is minuscule for non-college educated. Every one college educated who actually is a potential migrant to the rich country, 0.04 go, only 4% of people who want to go, or 4.7%. Second, the policy, in particular, it took a free labor movement, but they have an effect which is positive sometimes. So if we put full geography control, this effect is not even clear. But even when it's positive and significant, it's very small, this effect. Again, only one person among the less educated will be allowed to become a migrant if you have free mobility out of 100 that they want to become a migrant, uh, if you have free mobility. And the next slide shows you for college educated, Still, essentially, no effect of the free labor movement on college educated, but much larger effect, but not huge, but now out of 100 people who want to become migrants, 13 of them, if they are college educated, they can actually transform this potential into real. Um, obviously, you can do something much better, which is here we just look at how the law, the immigration law, affects the probability of becoming uh, actual migrant given potential. Uh, we, we try to interact the potential with the policy. So we said, what if the only country where there are a lot of potential migrants, if they have free mobility between themselves, also get a policy? So we interact the stock of potential migrants with this uh, zero one policy of free mobility. But again, we essentially, in the next uh, graph in which uh, there are, I point out uh, the interaction terms, when we interact free labor mobility with uh, uh, the law, we don't find very much. We find something uh, when we interact uh, the potential migrant with the growth of the receiving country, as if countries that are growing faster attract more migrants from countries where there are a lot of potential migrants. But again, see the magnitude, small quantitative effect of this. As that thing is flashing and is giving me the palpitation, I'm going to get to the conclusion. Um, and uh, essentially, this uh, overview of uh, a couple of approaches that economists have used in the last uh, 10 years, and again, I am presented by paper because I am too ignorant of uh, other people's paper to present, but there are many other papers that have improved and evolved on this. Um, I think they show how it is important to take different approaches, to have different uh, data and analysis, and then try to sift through and see what, what remains of the effect. Uh, I think that focusing on one policy at a time is seems to me more promising than trying to construct a complicated index, uh, because uh, the index seems to me a huge, uh, a huge step. So it's great to have codification and classification that tell us what the immigration policies are. It's great to have an idea of what the index is, but maybe using some of the prominent policies as Dan is in uh, is interesting. Um, of course, I only presented the, the, the data that use aggregate macro studies. I think there are incredibly interesting and important studies that do much more case-based micro, micro analysis. They can use a sharp probability identification strategy, and so it's useful also to go back and forth between micro and macro. I think that uh, not only looking at my paper, but looking at the balance of the literature I know, uh, when we try to figure out how much really policy which have drastically reduced the barrier between countries, how much they have affected free mobility, well, I think we find that most of the case, uh, uh, mobility of people, well, we find that most of the case times they have had an impact. Again, uh, I, we estimated the impact between 10, maybe 20% at the highest. Uh, our idea was that they should have an impact of 10 times, 20, a coefficient of 10, 20 increase, that's the things that the model will tell you, the number of migrants will increase by an order of magnitude. And we never got even remotely close to get anything. Admittedly, there are not too many free mobility agreements, and, uh, uh, and they are among the selected group of countries, but I would be uh, interested in making progress on this, and so far, um, that, that seems to be not the case. And finally, I think that uh, 
Uh, one crucial also distinction, uh, besides uh, looking at the impact on just numbers, in looking at the impact on type of migrant by level of education. Again, by working in this field and another, I became convinced that at the very least we should separate college educated and non, because the response is very different and their impact may also be very different in the country, in the receiving country. So I think that uh, uh, this is also um, one way, another way, certainly using this data on desired migration uh, can allow us another step further in understanding the effect of policies. And uh, uh, all of this, uh, all of this point, uh, I definitely acknowledge uh, uh, that the Demic group made very good and interesting progress in all of them. And uh, this is a great conference to come together and talk and think about what we learned. Okay. Thank you.